So one of the things that I found ma made my players very happy uh, when I started running the game was giving them all their own signature weapon. Uh, I'd given them their own uh, an early on weapon uh, when, in the first few sessions. I think I gave the rogue a thieves blade. I can't remember what I gave the barbarian, and the paladin got a explorer spear. But uh, they hadn't really taken to them, so I wanted to get. I uh, set out to find some homebrew things that uh, I could give them, and find weapons that they'd uh, take to. And I stumbled across uh, Dungeons on Demand, and they had some really cool uh, item, uh, really cool weapons on there, uh, with backstory already written. Uh, the weapons will get stronger as the characters got stronger and their prerequisites for uh, unlocking the next tier if you was into that and also you can make the weapons sentient uh, when I did it I didn't do the prerequisites or the sentience uh, it was a, my first time running I thought adding all of that in as well would uh, overcomplicate it for me uh, but what tell you a little bit about the weapons that I gave to the characters. Uh, I'll start with the Barbarian. They found out about these weapons. Uh, they found out basically the art, one of the Archdukes of Hell were returning and uh, they managed to track down a wizard. He said, oh you'll need these powerful weapons to defeat him. Uh, after they'd gone and blundered into the wizard's tower and uh, the bar I described this, I described this uh, alchemy lab to them and in the corner there is a chess set and the barbarian without thinking I immediately go over to it I'm like yes please please do what I think you're about to I touch it and try to win the game and of course they're all sucked onto the chessboard and the uh, the session ended there and they ended up fighting the chess army if you played Shining Force 2 you'll know what I mean but if not just, just google Shining Force 2 chess battle you know, it's really great. I've got to use an actual chess board and chess pieces, and uh, the players love it. But in the end, um, they win the battle, they speak with the wizard, uh, and they get locations in on where to uh, retrieve these weapons. And they have to, they pack up, they made like a mini expedition. You know, they're, they're going to be gone for a couple of weeks. They're going to be going over moors, uh, hilly, la hilly land, plains. You know, they're going to be gone for a while, so I've got them all packing up. They had, they got all their camping supplies, all ready to go. They shouted at Wilson to keep an eye on the boat. Wil Wilson is the man that uh, they rescued from the ghost ship. Uh, I might do a character... A campaign though on how they met him but they have a ship it's called the descending star uh, the joke very quickly came about that yes it probably would soon be des descending with them driving but anyway uh, the they first pick up the barbarians uh, mall and essentially they head east and they meet uh, they arrive at Basically, what looks like Stonehenge. I'll describe this as like uh, where the original owner of this weapon it's called the Last Word. This is where he used to hold his councils of war, and uh, they find a way to activate the Stonehenge esque place, and they are sucked through into uh, another plane and essentially they're in an ancient Roman Colosseum in the sky and above them is Charles Rageheart uh, this was the original owner of the weapon and he wants the character to prove himself and essentially I put them through six rounds of combat uh, the characters that I've had and players I've had really loved these where you essentially Put them into an arena, see how well they can do. Don't have a threat, of, don't have a threat of death, but you can see what it's really like and get a gauge for their strength about when they really cut loose and what they're capable of and how far you can push them. Uh, the first couple of rounds are fairly easy, and then I think I threw them up against a T-Rex and an Etin, 
Uh, that gave them a lot of trouble. Uh, they were quite clever. They managed to push over one of the, the barbarian managed to push over one of the crumbling pier, uh, pillars in the central, and it kind of comes out and crushes the T-Rex, and he's like, "Oh, uh, really? It really impressed Charles Ragehart." And then the final encounter was a. Uh, I want to say it was a young white dragon, but I think as the characters were quite low level at the time, I kind of dampened it down a little. But for these quests, what I designed was essentially the quest would be two parts. Uh, there'd be a combat, but then there'd be a social part. <clears throat> Shoal Rageheart was not only known uh, for being a great warrior, but also for being able to gain allies. And so for the second part, uh, what I arranged to do was I met with that, that player one-on-one -on -one and said, right, uh, the Shell Rageheart waves you forward and you step through a portal. The next thing he knows is in a stone room and on one side of the, uh, there's a big oak table, on one side is essentially a fey king of the forest a, fa a fairy king and at the other end is a uh, a, a essentially, essentially a head farmer of a village and Charles Raychart informs him that these two people are having a dispute and could be great allies to him but first he needs to get them to work together and if he can do that, he'll prove himself worthy of them all. And it turns out what's happened is there's recently been a new village established near the Faking's Forest. And the village has accidentally desecrated one of his holy trees. They've carved like graffiti into it and like dumped rubbish all over it. Uh, the Faking, I played him as a very. Uh, he'd recently taken over from his father and his father was a great man he, he was famous loved beloved by the Fae and, was, and now this younger king is overcompensating to try and be like his father and struggling to make his own mark on his people and essentially what had happened after um, desecrating this tree this farmland had always been very rich it always produced magnificent crops but uh, the Fae King had drawn away uh, the the reason it was so good for planting these crops was that the Fae, their magic helped increase it, increase the productivity, now that he feels insulted he withdrew that and now the village is starting to suffer and the Barbarian was very clever about it, uh, he spoke to both sides and he very quickly found out that the Fae King didn't really care about monetary gain, all he cared about was respect and being seen as the greatest. Uh, in the end he quickly made a deal he managed to quickly make a deal with the, between the two parties. Essentially, uh, the first the village had plenty of cows. The first cup of cream produced every week would be taken to that tree and placed in front of it. But it would be taken by a child, and it would be a different child every week, or alternating children so that those kids would grow up remembering that they are only here and that the only reason they are successful is due to the Fae. It wasn't so much what the gift is but more of the respect and uh, the Fae King said why, why should I accept this and uh, the Barbarian had spoken to a few of the Fae King's allies and said Excuse me. Uh, he'd spoken with a few of the Fae King's allies, and um, 
found out how he was kind of in his father's shadow. Yes, why well, your father was this and your father was that. It's like, you know, wouldn't you like to be known as not only his father's a, gr a great warrior, it's, wouldn't you not only like to be known as the great fighter, but all I can't I can't remember the out the fake king's name now. Let's call him. Let's call him. Let's call him John. Wouldn't you prefer to be known as? Would you like to be known as John the Powerful, or would you like to be known as John the Powerful, and the Wise, the man who can not only command the Fey, but humans also comply with his demands. And uh, the Fey King kind of sits there and <laughs> thinks about it. He originally only offered a cup of cream every week, but the Fey King demands the first cup of cream produced every week he puts it across as these humans acknowledging his power even though they are not his people he does not need to say he does not need to do or act only through his words he has influence this is what he can do not only do Fay bend to his will but so do the humans and of course faking loves this idea and uh, a bargain is quickly struck. Uh, the weapon that the barbarian was rewarded with, with was a large maul called Last Word, which we've already said. And it's a, a very interesting weapon in the fact that um, when it is given to a new owner, there's always a number of notches on the shaft, uh, which represent the number of kills. And when it's given to a new owner, those uh, notches reset. But the owner will always know how many notches are on here or on the shaft. And I thought that was a cool idea. Unfortunately, uh, I thought the barbarian was keeping track of that. And he just says to me one day, he's like, how many enemies have I killed? And I'm like, uh, I thought you was keeping track of that. He's like, uh, no. I've gone, ah, that's kind of killed the idea of the weapon bit but enough of that um, we'll move on to the tiers of power that it has uh, at first level it had uh, uh, essentially you get all the E attacks made by the weapon and magical and your strength it score increases by 2 while wielding the weapon it can exceed 20 but not 30 uh, for the second tier the uh, character had to be level 5 and the pre prerequisite for it was you must have dealt the killing blow to a creature of significant challenge that was large sized or larger large sized or larger with this weapon and was, I, I didn't incl include these bits so I thought that was going to be a bit awkward for me to include there probably was a way but I wasn't willing uh, I had a lot on my plate already so I just had it level up with them uh, the at level 5 the weapon also becomes a plus 1 weapon and it gets the warlord ability while holding the weapon you can use it to cast heroism as a first level spell using your strength modifier for its effect the ability cannot be used again until the next dawn now it's nice I've noticed that characters who can't really cast magic love something that gives them a spell they, they sometimes are always looking over at the spell casters going <sighs> man I wish I could do with some of that but what they don't realise is, is the paladins looking at the barbarian going ah, wish I could rage <laughs> mm. uh, but the prerequisites for each weapon tier get, uh, get slightly more difficult as you get a higher level uh, next tier, tier uh, le at level 9 uh, you must have used the weapon to break down a wall, door or barrier to reach and kill an enemy this probably wouldn't have been too much of a problem for our barbarian. Remember, he made to stop some cultists in one game. Uh, we, they were in a, a wooden house, and the cultists had locked themselves in a room, and the door was uh, magically sealed. And he go, he goes, we're in a wood house, right? And I've gone, yeah, thinking, damn it, I thought I had this. I thought I had this covered of ah, oh, they're going to go on a nice little adventure through the village, uh, and, and that'll take up the entire session. I charge through the wall. I'm like, oh, damn it! So they miss out a, a 
shit ton of content and then I've got to scramble to find something for the rest of the session <laughs> because they've literally skipped all of that but they you know they they felt great having he felt great having done that uh, the second prerequisite for that tier you must have convinced a group of strangers to assist you in combat uh, that again feeding back into the idea of gaining allies uh, then uh, the abilities from the ninth level uh, hero heroism can now be cast as a third level spell uh, the indomitable trait uh, which is while you are raging and holding this weapon you cannot be knocked prone and blood first uh, when you are raging once per round when you score a critical hit with this weapon to a creature that is not a construct or undead you regain 2d8 hit points <clears throat> and also uh, you get another point into your uh, strength score which can still exceed 20 but not 30 at tier 4 which is level 12 uh, you must have dealt the killing blow to a creature of significant size that was huge or larger with this weapon. Again, I don't think this one would have been too much of a problem. They have killed quite a few large things. Essentially what I have is a group of chucklehead players who walk around the world making wisecracks and staggering into hopeless situations and somehow coming out on top while the villains scratch their heads going, how the hell do we kill these guys? Uh, the weapon now becomes a plus two weapon and the all attacks made of it are still magical uh, the blood first is now 3d8 hit points that you regain on the critical hit uh, the indomitable perk uh, it still can't be not prone and when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack with this weapon the creature takes an additional d10 of bludgeoning damage and uh, the Warlord trait, Heroism spell now becomes a 5th level spell. <coughs> and the final tier is uh, tier 5, at level 15 or higher. Uh, you must have used this weapon to slay an enemy Warlord or leader in war. And the second prerequisite, you must have convinced a group of, of strangers to follow you into a dangerous locale, such as a battlefield or another plane of existence. Hmm. Uh, the weapon now becomes plus three magical weapon. Uh, the player's strength is now increased by an extra one as well, still exceeding 20, but not 30. Uh, the blood first remains at 3d8 for healing on a uh, 3d8 on a crit healing uh, indomitable the when the barbarian hits the creature with a opportunity attack the extra damage is now 2d10 instead of 1d10 and the warlord is still a fifth level spell but it can now be used twice a day and regains both charges at dawn. My barbarian took really well to this weapon and it got the other players excited, you know, can't wait to see his weapon, uh, which we'll probably cover in another video. I'm not sure when we'll upload that one. Uh, but this that will be the rogue's weapon, and that is the serpent sword, which is a rapier. And uh, I really, I think this was my favourite one out of the three. Maybe the paladin's one. I found more interesting but for actually playing the rogues one was really really cool but thank you guys for listening if you made it all the way through that it was very impressive you listened to me babylon for about 20 minutes uh, have a lovely day take care and i'll see you soon